Uh, so, uh, first of all, I'm very honored to be invited to uh, have a chance to talk about uh, my uh, vision about the future of computer systems. Um, so, uh, to do that, let's uh, set the scene by looking at where computer systems are today. Uh, what uh, this uh, graph shows is uh, a number of uh, uh, trends we have seen in uh, uh, computer architecture developments. Uh, so, uh, here we see basically the growth in the number of transistors on a microprocessor chip over time. And uh, let me remind you that the y-axis here is logarithmic. So, in fact, uh, there's been an exponential growth in the number of transistors on a chip. We are now up to several billions of transistors. And this used to be referred to as Moore's Law, uh, where we uh, have uh, been happy to keep doubling the number of transistors every two or three years or so. And if we go back in time to uh, before year 2000, then basically architects were very good at uh, translating um, the growth in the number of transistors and in fact also the clock frequency improvements to pretty much a doubling of the number, uh, doubling of compute performance every, every other year. But um, uh, at around 2003 what happened was that uh, it was not possible anymore to increase the clock frequency. One had played the game of increasing the clock frequency and reducing the voltage, as a supply voltage, and thereby keeping the power budget uh, constant. But that was not possible anymore. So what was called Dinard scaling actually uh, stopped. And so we all know what happened is that uh, microprocessor chips after that became mu multi-core uh, uh, chips where we kept you know, utilizing Moore's law, translating twice as many transistors to twice as many cores of processing engines on the chip. So that's where we took off on, on this uh, multi-core uh, era of computing. The trouble for the software then was that in order to uh, basically enjoy uh, an improvement of single thread performance, we had to start uh, writing parallel programs, which is uh, uh, quite challenging. Um, so basically, uh, that was the end, basically, of single thread performance, get, getting it automatically out of the chip, right? And also, frequency improvement stopped, and we had to stay within a certain power budget. Uh, now, unfortunately, also Moore's law is about to uh, stop. So in 10 years from now, I'm pretty sure we, there will not be any more growth in the number of transistors on a chip. So basically all these good uh, uh, scaling uh, laws are going to end. And is that the end of computer systems? No. In fact, I mean, it's so fun to being a computer architect these days, so certainly I don't want to retire, although I'm getting close to it. <laughs> Um, so, in fact, um, uh, this gives a lot of opportunities uh, to uh, innovate in terms of how we use the transistors. Always w when there is a large supply of something, then we are a little bit careless in using, utilizing the resources well. And let me tell you that there is a lot of room for improvement here. But also what we will, will happen is that performance will uh, be uh, concern all across the computer system layers. So we will see that it's a tremendous opportunity to, of course, tune the software to make better use of the, of the hardware, okay? So I like to see a computer system not as ha hardware guys or software guys. These guys must work together for the future of computing. And that is going to be even more important in the era of the post more era, if you say. Um, then, what is also happening, as we clearly see in AI, is that uh, for in, the, in the past, we have seen uh, that systems have been compute-centric. So, so basically, what has happened is that we have basically worried more about the compute elements than basically how to deal with the data. Now, this uh, is, uh, actually has changed because of 
uh, uh, more data-centric computing. We have seen it with, in terms of MapReduce that process uh, distributed uh, data repositories uh, massively in parallel, and also with machine learning, of course, which are uh, processed giant sets of training data. So we have entered uh, an era of data-centric uh, co uh, computing. And this happens to be at odds with how we have built computers for so long time. Here we see the first, what is called the first uh, uh, electronic computer, the ENIAC, built in 1946, and which uh, followed this stored program or introduced this stored program uh, computer paradigm. And today with a chip of, of uh, uh, big as a thumbnail or so, uh, we still do the same. We have the process on the one side and the memory on the other side, and we have to bring the data into the processing uh, element in order to carry out, for example, a floating point operation. And this used to be called the uh, uh, von Neumann bottleneck. We have survived this von Neumann bottleneck by having used cache hier hierarchies very efficiently. Um, and uh, the reason why they have worked is because of the principle of locality, that we tend to compute on the same data for quite some time so that uh, we can actually use part of the chip to have build uh, giant caches on the chip and keep the data there that is being processed. Uh, but in the era of, of uh, data-centric computing, where we march flow through huge data structures, the lo uh, locality principle is not as effective anymore. So uh, I believe that uh, uh, we, we will not be able to uh, think about computing in, in this way. If there is no data locality, then we get the, the immediately the problem of that we have to get the data off the chip. And uh, as we all know, there is a quite a significant speed gap between uh, doing uh, for a uh, floating point operation or bringing data uh, in from uh, main memory as a factor uh, two, or two orders of magnitude in speed difference, okay? But it's not, not only that, also uh, memory bandwidth is a scarce resource because the uh, pins on the chip uh, are uh, limit, uh, the limited number of pins limit the memory bandwidth. So that's another problem. And the third problem is, of course, power consumption. It was raised uh, before. Um, in fact, to, to um, carry out the floating point operation, the energy that is consumed there in comparison with bringing data from a, a block of data from the main memory, is actually three orders of magnitude difference in, in power consumption. So all this makes it pretty clear to me that we have to actually come up with a new paradigm how we design future computers, and that's going to be what the rest of my talk is all about. So I'm going to talk about uh, actually a, a pretty, uh, an idea that has been tried before, uh, the processing in memory concept. And uh, then I'm going to talk about, uh, um, we're launching two projects at, at Chalmers, one financed by uh, Wallenberg, WASP, the WASP program, and one by Wetenskapsrådet. And they uh, compl the complementary uh, 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 complementarity between these projects will actually hope to make some uh, advance in, in terms of using processing and memory. Now I'm going to talk about sort of the focus of these two projects. The WASP project is about mapping machine learning algorithms to processing and memory. And uh, the challenges there are um, parallelization and data management. And the other project, we look at programmability aspects because when we go to processing in memory, it turns out that uh, uh, you have to rethink the programming model itself. So processing in memory, what is that? So I uh, basically introduced the problem of, of uh, how we build computers today with processing engines on, on the one side and memory on the other. Here, uh, the idea is actually to move uh, uh, processing closer to memory or placing it inside the memory. So we basically uh, put processing uh, units inside the memory chip, okay? Um, and 
I'm going to talk a little bit deeper about what that means uh, technologically. And the advantage of that is, of course, that you can use the enormous bandwidth inside the chip, right? So to um, uh, go after shorter latency to bring data, um, uh, higher bandwidth, and also lower power consumption, okay? So all these good news. And I, there are all reasons to say that this is more adapted to where uh, applications are moving today with uh, uh, processing of giant data sets, okay? This is not a new idea. It usually is not a new idea, but uh, th this idea actually popped up in the uh, late 90s uh, uh, when uh, um, uh, as, uh, as an I idea to try to convince memory manufacturers to actually add a logical layer inside the uh, memory chip, okay? And there were a lot of, lot of projects in the US called Intelligent RAM, pushed by Dave Patterson at Berkeley, um, Flex RAM, pushed by uh, University of Illinois, etc. There were a lot of these projects. But it really didn't fly. Uh, because uh, um, still the mem mem memory uh, manufacturers wanted to s uh, uh, have uh, as uh, offer chips with higher, um, uh, with uh, a larger number of uh, 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 memory bits, you could say, and and uh, by actually uh, putting a logical layer there that would take, you know, remove some of the the uh, chip resources for. Uh, storing data. And also, um, of course, if you could have one memory chip and do the computation you need inside that memory chip, then everything would, would be quite appealing uh, if it had been the case that they would have introduced a logical layer. But the problem is that, of course, we, we, we need to scale, uh, we all always want to do computation on larger data sets, and so we need memory memory chips. And then you're immediately back because you cannot find all the data in the memory chip where you have the processing units. You have to go across to another uh, memory chip. And so much of the advantages uh, go away, unless you kind of start to think about this as a parallel computer. And at that point in time, we were still, you know, didn't like parallel computing. Uh, because of the big, you know, uh, gap in programmability that it would... Then later on, just a few years after that, we had a multi-core shift and we had to... The reality was actually parallel computers. But this idea was basically uh, introduced at, at not the uh, best point in time. Uh, but uh, what I will argue is that uh, time is ripe to look into this now. Because... We are in the era of data-centric applications, as I've talked about. Secondly, more slow is ending. So um, we're also in the era of acceleration. Uh, Thomas talked about one accelerator, that's the GPU. But right now, what's happening is uh, basically that uh, accelerators are, are mainstream. We have seen that with uh, machine learning, with the TPU at Google. and. Uh, also using FPGAs, as uh, has happened at Microsoft, etc. So we are really, if we look at, you know, uh, each year's proceeding now in computer architecture, there uh, are many, many sessions, basically, of course, on machine learning and especially on acceleration. So we are certainly uh, going into that area. So that's another w reason for that. Also. There are me emerging memory technologies now that makes uh, uh, the processing in memory fit nicely into what is happening anyway. For example, uh, what is happening is that people are building memory chips with, with uh, uh, free, 3D, which in 3D, which means that they stack memory chips on top of each other. And so you can stack it onto a logical uh, layer, you could say, and embed in that uh, accelerators, and then we talk about uh, um, uh, near memory processing. It's not in memory processing because you have not put basically the compute engines inside the memory chips, but it's very close. It's on the same uh, chip, you could say, okay? So here we have an example of, of such a, um, uh, such a uh, technology. 
it's called high bandwidth memory chips and uh, where you have the uh, memory layers here and there are what is called through silicon vias that are uh, actually connecting all those to a uh, logical layer. And so you get an enormous memory bandwidth here. And what you can do is actually to put uh, uh, accelerators in this logical layer. A little bit more uh, probably into the future is uh, a way to use, uh, uh, for example, resistive RAM and do the processing inside the, the storage uh, units through an analog computing devices and things like that, which is also very interesting. So for all these reasons, it makes sense to actually um, look into uh, this, and that's why I'm betting on this for the future, and uh, will uh, invest my research time with PhD students on this topic. And I'm going to tell you exactly what we are up to doing. What it means is, of course, again, as I mentioned, disruption in in uh, programming models, because we have to deal with the fact that we have multiple computing memory chips, okay? And how we're going to expose this to the programmers. Um, that's a very important question I'm going to get back to. So the vision here is that we have multiple of these memory chips that can compute, which are called PIM here. And um, uh, for example, uh, near data processing where we have, for example, HBM chips with a logical layer in which we embed accelerators. And uh, this will form a massively parallel system. And um, the PIM chip could contain also general purpose processors for controlling the accelerators. We'll talk a little bit about that in the context of the European processor initiative that Chalmers is part of uh, where we look at uh, uh, RISC-V based accelerators. I'm going to get back to that a little bit later. Am I doing with the time? Okay, I guess. Uh, so what are the challenges here? What we're going to look at is how we, we on, on this array of PIM chips are going to map data structures so that uh, we can minimize data transfers. That's the key. That will translate into higher performance because of shorter latency, because of less uh, uh, data transfers, uh, less bandwidth problems, and very importantly also lower uh, energy consumption, okay? Then the other uh, challenge here is actually how we're gonna schedule the computations across these parallel machines so as to maximize parallel. So it's the problem, the new problem here is actually doing data data, mapping the data structures and uh, scheduling the application so as to um, uh, uh, maximize efficiency here. This definitely means that um, we're going to depart from a compute-centric to a data-centric programming model. I'm going to talk a little bit about my view about how to do that, actually that is rooted in research I've done over the past uh, five years in the context of, a, uh, of an ERC uh, uh, project. So the scale machine learning, machine learning and the memory bottleneck project. Um, so here, um, uh, machine learning algorithm, as we all know, you have basically, you do, um, uh, uh, Mac operations in, in the compute, uh, compute nodes here, and the edges here are basically the data transfers needed. So there's a lot of data transferring happen happening in, in this. Um, uh, and that's what, what caused performance problems and which actually caused high energy consumption. So we want to actually map this onto uh, a uh, processing, in, uh, processing in memory chip array, you could say, and um, that way actually we can, uh, we hope to uh, improve efficiency significantly. What this graph shows, it's from a quite recent study, is the uh, opportunity of reducing uh, uh, the energy consumed by actually using, uh, when we compare uh, using traditional memory technologies like DDR4 
which uh, with uh, uh, what is called uh, 3D stacked uh, memory technology called uh, hybrid memory cubes. And what we can see here is that there is an uh, enormous reduction in, in energy consumption. And when we then in the last, the rightmost uh, bar, when we actually add uh, computing inside the chip, then we can reduce the transfer. So it's just an illustration of actually how important uh, this technology is. So, going back to machine learning application again, what we want to do is to partition this, uh, partition this uh, um, graph, you could say, so that we minimize um, data transfers and maximize parallelism. And this becomes like, uh, basically, uh, uh, you, you need to do uh, some graph partitioning first, and then actually you want to compute as much locally as possible. So that becomes basically how do you do distributed machine learning uh, across many chips. So a lot of interesting problems here to solve to really take advantage of the PIM technology that uh, uh, we are very excited to start. Uh, we just got a PhD student, so we are about to start uh, basically uh, by, by the start of next year, this project. The other project that we are also launching now is actually looking at um, PIM from a programmability point of view. So basically how, how, you, how you would use PIMs today would be to have a standard CPU that offloads basically the computation to these PIM arrays, uh, like pretty much the way you use uh, GPUs. Um, this is okay if data fits in a single processing in memory chip, but it will likely not do that. So the issues when allowing data to be accessed across PIMs are the usual family of NUMA problems of non-local access, which has been looked at before, so the problem of having a number of memory modules and where to actually fit the data. This, uh, this has been looked at before. Um, um, but we want to be a little bit more radical than that. There is also need for cache coherence maintenance across the chips. But uh, if you go this traditional route, the, uh, you, I'm sad to say that it, you're still going to go after, uh, look at this as a compute-centric machine. What we want to do is to basically look at um, these chips as, uh, lo lo doing as localized computations as possible. And so we're going to look at a new concept that has been, of course, looked at a little bit before, but this is a pretty uh, radical uh, approach, I would say, which we call move code to data, the data programming model instead of moving data to, to the code, which is the traditional way of computing. So the way I envision this is actually that we do the mapping of the data structures, and then uh, if we manage to do that in a very distributed way, then we can move computations to where the data is, and then you will have this local computation in each node with all these uh, tremendous uh, uh, good things that can happen with um, um, reducing memory bandwidth, power consumption, etc. And in fact, uh, uh, we looked, we sort of set the scene for such an interesting uh, development in the ERC project that we had at Chalmers that, that co concluded this year, in which we studied um, uh, uh, new data flow task-based programming models, which are actually out there in OpenMP. And basically what the programmer has to do is to uh, specify, of course, with the task also the data structures that uh, will be uh, computed on. So for example, for task A here, it, uh, the programmer has uh, uh, marked that it will output uh, data structure A to be used by task B. So here, uh, task B will uh, annotate data structure as input, okay? And that basically creates a, a data flow graph, which uh, runtime systems can build as the program are 
is executing. And we use that for a lot of optimizations in the memory hierarchy. So this comes very natural to use this also to uh, basically uh, say, OK, so if this task is actually using data structure A, then we should actually move it to the uh, PIM chip where data structure A sits, right? So we basically use this static information to guide where to uh, uh, schedule the processors. But this is, of course, more difficult than that because we have to be smart how we distribute data structures. But this will be the starting point for the project, okay? That brings me to um, the last slide where I want to basically give a quick update on what is happening with this European processor initiative. The whole reason for, for this is actually, of course, what is happening in the world that we see that uh, uh, China is uh, advancing a lot and the US is, is actually uh, has, has changed politics as well. Now I don't want to go into that route. Uh, so European wants to be independent in terms of high-performance computing processor technologies. So they started uh, this kind of um, big, pr big project called the European Processor Initiative. I've done that before with Airbus and to, with the really goal of building up a, a European processor industry. And I got invited from, uh, as the only uh, organization with Chalmers in Sweden to participate in this uh, 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 development. And uh, in fact, already 2023, there will be the first uh, exascale machine with this technology. And we are actually, we started this project and it's on, on, on uh, a good, uh, uh, doing good progress. So we're gonna tape out in the fall of next year, the first chip generation, and then there will be subsequent after that. Good, so that basically uh, comes, uh, leads me to the conclusion. All scaling laws are not anymore, so time to move on. And uh, per personally, I believe that it's very interesting to look into PIM technologies. All the technological parameters are there to make it meaningful to dive into that direction. And I talked about the vision of the two projects we are launching at Chambers. Thank you very much, back to Anders. Great, so th th thank you very much, Per. Um, we have room for a couple of questions before the coffee break here. So, let's see who wants to go first. Let's see, right over there. Simon. Thank you for a nice uh, talk, Per. Um, one question I have is the end part where you have um, the task graph will yes. define your parallelization. Couldn't you do that with the earlier methods? So if we go back so, again. So, so you, you have, your, your initial statement is that your um, memory intensive operations mm -hmm. are the reasons why you want to change paradigm. Mm -hmm. So um, if I'm going to have to do that, making the computations local, couldn't I do it with earlier architectures or the current accelerator architecture we were discussing before? Well, uh, so, uh, well, you cannot because you don't have the, pro first of all, I mean, not as radical as I'm talking about having processing uh, elements inside the process of chips, right? That is not existing today. but. You can use pretty much, I mean, this on, I mean, any computer system, we have local memory versus, you know, remote memory. And so you could basically use this programming model for existing systems, right? So it's applicable there as well, because we always have local and, and, and more remote memory. That's true. I, I guess that's what, what yeah, so, so, so the difference is really the, the, the distance between your uh, memory and Well, it's a huge, it's your a quite memory, radical or? difference because, I mean, the way we build processor chips, being it GPUs or, or, or CPUs, you have one chip where you have the processing units, right? And you have 
other ships with the memory. And you, you will be, you have this bottleneck, right, where you have to bring the data inside the chip. And even worse, I mean, with this uh, uh, machine learning and these data-intensive applications, caches are pretty useless. And, and, and that's very bad for my heart because I've spent, you know, decades of doing research on caches and, you know, I had to reinvent myself. <laughs> okay. Hi. Um, does your programming model here envision fault tolerance as well? Or is there a need for it even? Sorry. Well, um, the, the programming model you have, yes. uh, do you also envision fault tolerance? So that's not anything I, I will, we will look into, but there is certainly a need for that as well, yes. Up there and back and then one more here and then we have to wrap up. Thank you. Uh, what programming language are most suitable for this new architecture? So, so our initial uh, take on that is actually to very pragmatically build it on OpenMP, which uh, actually is something that is uh, basically exists for C, C++, and Fortran. So uh, pretty traditional way of programming. I'm kind of a pragmatic guy, so I don't believe in, it's very hard to make a paradigm shift in programming language, as history has told us. So I like to be a little bit pragmatic, and I got very excited about the project we just concluded, that there is a way to actually use that uh, development, those developments. Okay, so one more there. Uh, yeah, we'll, do, we'll do that one, and then we'll uh, hear first, and then we'll do that one, and then we'll wrap up. So go here first. Uh, all right. So uh, so we have a lot of memory cells around, and you want to move the processing elements close to the memory cells. So what's that going to do with your transistor budget? Sorry? What, what what's that going to do with your transistor budget? You said that uh, you have to keep the number of transistors constant in the future. So um, the more... Uh, the most realistic thing right now is actually to take advantage of, uh, as I said, these uh, uh, new memory technologies like HBM, where you already have a logical layer. Uh, that's one possibility, but there are also other possibilities. Uh, a new way of actually building systems is, is uh, using interposers, which is basically a logical layer, and then you glue memory chips and processor chips on that. And so you could also use this interposer, which is just, you know, uh, which is called active interposer, where you could put logic to actually place the processors closer to the memory chips. That's basically, you could say, what is doable within 10 years. Now, I also talked about resistive memory, new memory technologies coming out. There you will do really the processing inside, you know, the, the memory chips uh, in uh, an analog fashion. And, and that's, of course, more long term. But it all requires a lot of processing resources and space and power. Uh, absolutely. So one of the, the um, uh, well, power for power, you, you problem with 3D stacking is actually to get the heat out, right? So, so that's going to be uh, certainly a uh, challenge, right? Uh, but the uh, counter to that is that you actually you will not have to dissipate a lot of power going between chips, right? So that's uh, lots of savings there. We'll see. That's right. at least, you know, where I like to... Final yeah, question. Um, yes. My question is if you have been in, in discussion with, uh, with the industry and, for example, uh, processing units manufacturers such as uh, NVIDIA and, and similar, and what have their, if so, have they shown interest in this new paradigm? Yes, yes. Actually, HMC has, is uh, pursuing something in this, uh, the high, high, high hybrid memory cube that uh, has been projects that have been uh, disclosed going in this direction. So I see a lot of interest in this direction. I'm certainly not the only one on the globe looking into that. There are, there are a lot of other research projects around the world that are going in, in a similar direction. Yeah. All right.
So thank you very, very much, Per. Thank you.